Welcome. Thank you for watching this Bible teaching from Island Community Church in downtown Memphis, Tennessee. We hope today's message will help you grow in relationship with Jesus. You can access more gospel resources and ways to connect with our church at iccmemphis.com or by downloading our Island Community Church app. Thanks again for joining us. So excited about the opportunity to teach this particular passage from Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 31, because to be honest, it is like a climax of all that we have been looking at uh, over the last five weeks. It is like the culmination of all that Paul has been leading us to in these last chapters. Uh, We're going to have the opportunity this morning to look at uh, just these 10 verses and what God has to say for us through them. Uh, The main point this morning, if you got something to write down, I'd always encourage you to take notes, but the main point this morning is this. God's righteousness is available to all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, right standing with God is available to all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Paul's been talking about the gospel uh, as he's been moving through this book, and we've been talking about it together week after week after week. What is the gospel? It's the what? The good news. And we say that loud and with a smile on our face because it's an announcement, a very joy-filled, exciting, wondrous announcement. It's like somebody running onto the battlefield in the midst of war and saying, hey, it's done. Like victory is secure. The good news is here. What is the good news? The good news, not of what we do, but of what God has done. The good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ to save all who trust in him. Well, Paul, um, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at um, chapter 1, starting at verse 18, uh, all the way through chapter 3, verse 20. And Paul has been again and again and again, you guys know this because we've been studying this, right? Again and again and again, he's been saying, hey, it's important that you recognize that all of us, yes, all of us are great sinners. He's been talking to us about how we need the gospel because what is true for every single one of us because of our sin is that we are under the wrath of God. In other words, things are not good between us and God. And the reason things aren't good between us and God is because of what has happened in our hearts and in our lives by us making a choice to turn away from God and turn to things that God has created rather than to worship the creator, God himself. We have made idols out of all kinds of things in life. We have suppressed truth for a lie. We have exchanged God for lesser things. We have rebelled against him, even though we knew he existed and knew that we should be submitted to him. We went our own way and we made ourselves and our idols the center of everything. And because of that, things aren't good between us and God. And Paul's been laying out this uh, in a very structural way talking about how this is true for the non-religious, even people who aren't religious, this is true for them. Gentiles, Paul refers to them in his day, non-Jewish people, non-religious. It's also true for those who even are religious because what's important is not the behavior of the body, but the posture of the heart. And in the heart, even amongst religious people, there's a desperate need for salvation. And in case you missed it, he said, this is true for all of us. Everyone is not right with God. None of us are right with him. None are righteous. No, not even one. And so what he's been saying to us is all of us are great sinners. But friends, in the passage that we're going to be looking at today, what is so amazing is that he's going to be leading us to see here in these 10 verses that ultimately, though all of us are great sinners, What we have to understand is that God has come for us and Jesus. And though all of us are great sinners, he is an even greater savior. 
At the end of the day, yes, we have to recognize our sin, our desperate need for him, but we also must see his salvation and his amazing grace and kindness to all who believe. Another way to think about exactly, I'm I'm trying to help you because my joy is to pastor you, to help you to get the precious truth of God's word, to not just understand it with your minds, but to savor it with your heart. So I'm trying, again, to, to think about a way to say this so you can kind of get the flow here, the structural argument that Paul's making. So in, ver- in chapter 1, starting verse 18 through chapter 3, verse 20, another way to understand it would be Paul is actually exposing the deepest problem of our lives, and that is our sin nature, our brokenness of heart and life. But then as we turn the corner into chapter 3, verses 21 to, to 31, What he's going to be doing here in the passage we're studying today, he's actually going to be saying, though your problem has been exposed, your sin, I want you to know that God has stepped in to solve your problem. And he's done it in salvation. He's done it in a saving way in Jesus Christ. So I hope that helps um, a little bit kind of understand um, where we've been and where we're going to be today. And like I said, I told you just a second ago, this particular passage is so important. Um, Martin Luther, uh, some of you guys might know him. Um, He was the guy who kind of led out on what's known as the Reformation, Um, a big move back to the teaching, the pure teaching of the gospel, the good news of God and Jesus Christ for all who believe. Martin Luther actually said famously of this particular passage that these 10 verses, he says, quote, are the chief point, the very central place of the epistle and the central place of the entire Bible. Interesting, right? Hard to put a single passage in focus as like the most important passage in the whole Bible. But Martin Luther actually said, if you want to understand the scripture, the central point of the scripture, then you've got to understand these 10 verses. Um, Others have said it's probably the most, or possibly the most important single paragraph ever written. Uh, New Testament scholar C.E.B. Cranfield calls the passage the center and the heart of the whole letter, if not the whole Bible. So, I'm trying to set it up by saying... Aren't you glad you're here today? Aren't you glad for the opportunity to lean in, to know the truth of God's word? And I truly believe um, this is one of the passages, some of you know my own personal story. Um, I was, the trajectory of my life was in a much different direction until I was in college. And I was largely saved through Uh, a systematic study of the book of Romans. And I remember getting to this passage, and of course I was saved also by the work of God's Spirit and the influence and and evangelism and discipleship of other people in my life who love Jesus. But I remember getting to this particular point in the book of Romans and falling on my face in worship, literally, and being amazed at God and how God would save a sinner like me. And so more, more than just an intellectual exercise this morning, I want to, to really worship God even as I'm teaching, and I pray that this would be an opportunity for worship for you to understand the precious truth of who God is and how he saves us in Jesus Christ. So um, one quick thing before we get started into the passage of the day, one quick additional thing is I want you to see a connection, all right? In your Bibles, will you look at chapter 1, verse 16 and 17? And then I want you to to find chapter 3, verse 21, all right? Put your finger on both of those those places. Because in just a second, what I want to do is read both of those verses and basically try to help you understand 
that Paul is picking back up where he left off at Romans 1, 16 and 17, which we've been reciting together every single week, right, from memory. That's kind of our theme verse of the book of Romans. So if you can understand what Paul's doing here, and we're going to see this in a second as we read the two verses side by side, but they mirror each other. Both verses, Paul is talking about a way that God makes us right with himself through Jesus Christ as we believe, through faith. A righteousness in Jesus for all who believe. That's his point in Romans 1, 16 and 17. And he's going to pick back up the point in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. Which basically reinforces your understanding now that the stuff in between is the background information that you need to fully appreciate the righteousness in Jesus that is available to all who believe. So Romans 1, 16, 17, directly correlated. It's like Paul picking right back up his argument here in Romans chapter 3, verse 21. So we'll start in Romans 1, 16 and 17, all right? And this one uh, we can quote from memory. Uh Uh-oh. All right. So what I want to do is I want to start by looking at Romans 1, 16 and 17, and let's read it together uh, because this is one that we know and have memorized together. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, I want you to see the parallel. Flip over. Romans 3, verse 21. I'm going to read the whole passage. You don't have to read it with me. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? (laughs) By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. This morning, we're going to be talking about the righteousness of God in Jesus for all who believe from these 10 verses in Romans chapter 3. This morning we're going to make a list together and the list is all going to be about the person of Jesus Christ. And I'm excited to be able to walk through together um, exactly how Jesus provides righteousness for us as we put all of our trust in him. And I want to tell you at the beginning, my aim this morning is to lead you to worship to lead you to put all of your confidence and your trust in Jesus because he's wonderful and he's worthy. So first, we're going to start our list by looking at how Jesus is our salvation. 
The first point this morning is Jesus is our salvation. Verse 21. I want you to notice um, how this verse starts. And really, the whole point comes from the first two words. Do y'all see it? But now. (laughs) But now, Paul says, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. But now. So essentially, after Paul, over the last chapters, has laid out the case for our dreadful condition, after he has helped us to see how desperately we need salvation, how things are not right between us and God, and there's nothing we can do to put ourselves right with God. It's the most dreadful condition known to man, being in a place where you're not right with God. But out of Paul's discussion of how we're not right with God bursts forth these two words, but now. Essentially what he's doing is he's leading us to hope. He's helping us to see a shift. It's not just a shift like in the letter, it's a shift in history. That God has has stepped in to intervene. But now. Um, all throughout New Testament, you guys, um, this phrase is used. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of this and hope you'll make a list as we go through. But again and again and again in the New Testament, in Paul's writings and in other writings, the Bible wants us, God wants us to notice how he has stepped in, how he has moved in to intervene and to, to actually sit and to contrast our situation before He came in compared to our situation after he came in. Galatians 4, 8 and 9. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. Every time y'all see the phrase, but now, you're welcome to read it with me, right? But now that you have come to know God or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again? Ephesians 2, 11 to 13. Therefore, Remember at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made by the flesh of hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Do you know who you once were? Do you know how helpless you were, how alienated you were, how far off from God you were, how hopeless you were? But now, God has not left you on your own. He has stepped in. But now, in Jesus Christ, do you know what a difference he's made? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. For at one time you were in darkness... But now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Colossians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26. At that time, he sh- his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. Once. You were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 1 Peter 2, verse 25. For once you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and to the overseer 
of your souls. Paul says, Romans chapter 3, verse 21, don't overlook any word of scripture. But now. In other words, he's saying, I want you to see that your God is a saving God. You were helpless. You were hopeless. You were in a dreadful condition. You were not right with God. There was nothing that you could do about it. But the good news of the gospel is that but now God has stepped in to do something that you could never do. He has stepped in to do for you a saving work to put you right again with God. It's almost like um, you ever tried to play sports? I tried one time and I decided that it wasn't for me. Um, I could imagine though us going down this afternoon to Mud Island with a soccer ball and us trying to like get a game together and y'all know the World Cup is going on right now, right? So let's imagine that um, we, as an ICC team, get charged with trying to represent the United States against Iran. I can't remember the game, but the next game, I think, is against Iran. And it's a big game. It's like a make-or-break game, right? Can y'all imagine us? I'm talking to look around. Can y'all imagine us going out there to the soccer field this afternoon, and we're like, okay, guys, we're here, <laughs> you know? Not going to go very well. Sports has never gone very well for me, actually. Um, I did win thumb football once in field day. I'm very proud of that. Um, but <laughs> I'm trying, guys. But imagine we get out there and it's a hot mess, which it would be. And it looks like there's no hope. And we're looking around at each other going, how is this ever going to happen? But then we have a but now moment, Right? And over in the corner of our eye, we actually see the real U.S. team, the professionals, the ones who are trained, who are capable, who are able to do this, show up. And we all go, what? Oh, thank goodness, right? The ones who are here can actually do something about winning this game. That's a silly illustration because we're in the middle of a World Cup and maybe it'll connect with some of us, but... There needs to be this sense of relief that comes to us when we truly recognize our helpless and broken condition, not just at the time where we first call out to Christ, but I mean on an everyday basis where we recognize our helpless and broken condition apart from someone coming in, someone stepping in to do what we cannot do. We have to feel the relief of this phrase, but now because what Paul is leading us to see is that Jesus has stepped in to save. And what an amazing gift it is to know the salvation of Jesus Christ. Secondly, Jesus is not only our salvation, but he's also our justification. Jesus is not only our salvation, but he is our justification. The big question um, that really every world religion seeks to answer <laughs> is the question that Job asks. In chapter 9, verse 2, there's a, there's a time in which Job verbalizes this question. Literally, the question is, how can, one, how can a man be right with God? How can someone be put right with God? These verses of Paul, starting in verse 21 through verse 23, answer the question, really through 24. He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. How can one 
be put right with God. Well, you notice um, this word right here, righteousness, all right? This is the language of a courtroom, okay? And it's the same root word for righteousness and justification all through this passage and all through the book. And essentially, what Paul is trying to get us to imagine is you are in a courtroom and a just, justification would be what a judge does when at the end of a trial, the defendant who's standing there, when the judge would say at the end of a trial, not guilty. Okay? That's the picture of righteousness. So what Paul is saying is, how does righteousness, how does a declaration of not guilty come when we know our own unrighteousness? Now, every single religion, every single culture in the world tries to answer this question. And every single one, apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, apart from what we proclaim in Christianity, every other one would say it's about your moral record or your spiritual record. It's about your performance. In other words, at the end of the day, if you're worthy enough, if you're good enough, if you, if you do the, the right things, the right rituals, the right sacraments, if you keep this set of laws, if you take these pilgrimages, if you cross your hands this way, if you give to the poor, if you are baptized in this way, or if you're married in this way, or if, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, what you're wanting is all of us knowing God exists and knowing that we're not right, every other religion and culture would say to you, just make sure that at the end of life that your good outweighs your bad. Just make sure that you, 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 you live as worthy as you can live. You try as hard as you can try. You do as best as you can so that you can be good enough before God and to be accepted. But Paul comes on the scene and proclaims a crazy message because he says, but now the righteousness, in other words, the declaration of God over your life, not guilty, the righteousness of God, it has been manifested, but it's not what you think. First, how can one be right with God? First, you have to understand it comes apart from the law. It comes apart from the law. This is right here. The righteousness of God has been manifested, number one, Apart from the law. Now, this is fascinating. Because what Paul's basically saying is, you can't get a no guilty verdict by any action or effort on your part. There's nothing you can do. It, it is not at all about your good works outweighing your bad works at the end. In fact, it doesn't have to do with your work at all. It comes completely apart from anything that you would do under the law of Moses, under the instruction of God. This blue <laughs> good law keepers and, and Jewish scholars away in the day. You remember when Jesus said in Mark chapter 22 that God would reveal his righteousness in a way that was like uh, the only way you could compare it was like old wide skins versus new wine skins. And he's saying something new has to happen. You're not going to get it by just trying to fill up the old again and again and again. This is, it's not the righteousness of God, the no guilty verdict of God, right standing with God. Try, your thought about trying to, to get that, to attain that, to in the end be okay with that by anything that you would do, that's done. He says it's apart from the law. But then he says, but don't misunderstand. 
although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So what he's saying here is actually there's a continuity in the entire Bible. The entire Old Testament. This is one of the reasons that I always say, please read the Old Testament. Yes, we are a New Testament, Jesus-loving people. But do you know that the Old Testament, all of it was given to us to point our way to this new righteousness in Jesus Christ. All of it was meant to get our attention to the way that God actually saves. God gave us the law. It wasn't like that was plan A. Oops, it didn't work. So now we have to send plan B in Jesus Christ. No, plan A was always Jesus Christ. And the law was given to us to show us the holiness of God and our sinfulness of heart and life and to lead us to recognize that the only way that we can do this is for one to come to save us. Do you see? It was, it's, it's, it's a continuous thing. The law and all of the prophets have, have pointed to this, but don't mistake it. It's not going to come. Being right with God is not going to come through the law. It comes apart from the law. Secondly, look at verse 22. The second thing that we can answer is how can we then be right with God? Well, we know it's not from the law, so how does it come? Here it is. The righteousness of God, so this is the not guilty verdict. How? What does he say here? Number two, through faith in Jesus Christ. And in case you wondered if it's only by faith, right? He said it in Romans 1, 16 and 17. Now here in chapter 3, verse 22, he's saying through faith in Jesus Christ. And then he says it again. For all who what? Who believe. In other words, this is a heart thing. This is not an action thing. So what he says is, number two, how can one be right with God? Through faith in Jesus Christ. So the amazing thing is, what he says is, for those who look to Christ, for those who look away from themselves and they look to Jesus, Empty handed. <laughs> they just go to Jesus and they say, Jesus, I, I believe you. I, I, I believe that you are a savior. And, and Jesus, I believe that you've stepped in. Like, I, I'm standing in court and I know, Jesus, that like, I, I, I deserve a guilty verdict. But Jesus, I believe that you have like stepped in and like you could s- take my place. I believe that you're a savior. So Jesus, I'm going to remove myself completely and I'm going to put all of my trust and my hope in you. And Jesus, I I, I trust you. I believe you. You're my everything. Anybody ever been on an airplane? Some of us don't like flying too much, especially when uh, it gets turbulent. Anybody like turbulence? I don't think anybody likes turbulence. Um, I'm a sucker for the videos on Instagram that show the, like, flight horror video things. I don't know why I like those, but I always watch them like, whoo, you know, those moments of just like, oh, sheer terror. But anyway, um, it takes, I don't even know why I told you that just now. Um, The thing is, I think the reason I told you that is because airplanes are incredibly, like, sturdy. And it takes a lot to like get on the airplane, but what you're trusting is not your own ability once you get on that airplane. You're trusting the airplane to get you safely to your destination. So we don't have faith in our own faith in the airplane. We actually have faith in the airplane. (laughs) For us, faith in Christ, it's not faith in our faith itself. It's not the size of our faith that matters. It's the object of our faith. The question is, are we on the airplane, so to speak? Have we shifted our confidence from self to Christ? And what Paul is saying is, there is a way to be right with God that comes through faith. Through you moving, exchanging your confidence in self and anything else of work for your own salvation and putting all of your confidence in Christ. 
How can you be right with God? That's it. Putting your whole trust in Jesus Christ. The next thing that he answers for us is, how can we be right with God? He says, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The third way that we can be right with God, Paul says, is by receiving. Just by taking the posture of one who is empty-handed and knows they have need and is willing to receive, to embrace, to actually accept a free and saving gift of God. Paul says there is no distinction. In other words, there's no difference between people. All of us have sinned. All of us are under the power of sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. In other words, God's awesome presence. We all fall short of the glory of God. We're all in need. But he says here, but all of us have the opportunity to be justified. Here it is again. This is the same as the same root word as righteousness, that understanding the courtroom language of not guilty. All of us have the opportunity to be justified, and here it is, number three, by his grace as a gift. Grace it means that this is something that God does freely out of his own nature. He wants to do it. There's no outside force that's requiring him to do this. This is a, the kindness of God, the love of God for you. There was nothing that required God to save you. Do you know that? Nothing required God to save you. God has chosen in his love for you. God sees you and he loves you. And out of his own love for you, he has come for you. It is his grace. And it is nothing that we do. It is all a gift. So to understand how to be right with God, we, we, we have to understand it's first, nothing that we do. Second, it's all of what Jesus does. And us connecting with Jesus, us getting on the plane, us trusting Jesus. And third, us living empty-handed and just coming to Jesus empty-handed and allowing him to fill us. It's like a picture. Emma Grace is two years old, um, our little girl. She has not figured out how to take the tops off, thankfully, of um, the like nutrition packs. I don't know what you call those things. The pouches. Veggie pouches. Thank you, Michelle. Um, veggie pouches. She loves those things. Thankfully, she loves vegetables. I mean, she could love worse things, like I love Oreos. So um, she could definitely open that. But she wants the little veggie pouches. And so she comes, so sweet. And we're trying to teach her to say please, but she comes so helpless, right? Two years old. And she needs nutrition. And she comes and she brings a veggie pouch. And she's like, Mommy, Daddy, veggie pouch. We have taught her to say, please, right? That childlike innocence, and what a joy it is for me as her father, for Michelle as her mother, to be able to open that pouch and to be able to supply her need. It's that childlike faith that God desires from all of us. If we're going to have righteousness, right standing with him, we have to become like little children, and we have to recognize what we need we don't have, but we can go to our Father, our good Father. And he has promised that for those who ask, he will give, he will supply, he will provide all that is needed and more. He will open it up for us and he will feed us. That is the picture of how God makes us right with him. I'll close this section by just mentioning how Wayne Grudem defines this in his a classic book, Systematic Theology, he defines justification as the instantaneous legal act of God in which he, one, thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us, and two, declares us to be righteous 
in his sight. Where he declares us to be righteous in his sight. One thought experiment that Paul is encouraging you to do is to put yourself in the courtroom of God. A lot of us think we talk about stories, little jokes time to time. At, uh, you know, somebody's going to die and he gets before God and he's, what's he going to say? You know, those kind of things. And some of us imagine, right? We imagine a time where we're standing before God in his courtroom. We know God to be a judge. And there's a standard of righteousness. We're the defendant. And the question is, what is the basis of us claiming to be right with God? How is it that the judge will rule? And what Paul is leading you to, to imagine is that on your own, standing before the judge, there's no righteousness. There's, there's nothing that you can claim in and of yourself. There's nothing. The only verdict that would come down if it's just you in that courtroom is guilty, unrighteous, not right with me. But what he's saying is how amazing because as you're standing there and the, the lump is in your throat, so to speak, and you're recognizing, oh my goodness, I have nothing to say. I'm in huge trouble here. The record of my sins is piled up against me. I am guilty as charged. This is not going to go well in the end. As soon as that moment comes, as the gavel gets to be raised, he goes, but, but wait. You hear in the courtroom, but wait. <laughs> There's a way. And into the courtroom steps God himself and Jesus Christ. I, I want to take his place. You take my record of righteousness and put it in his place. And take his record and count it against me. I, I, I'm willing to do an exchange here. And Jesus steps in to the courtroom and he takes the place of the defendant. And, and we have that moment of decision. Will we let him, will we get out of the way and let him take our place? Will we look to him as our champion, as our savior, as our forgiver, as our righteousness? Will we put our trust in ourselves? Will we remain on the stand or will we allow Jesus to take our place? But for all who allow Jesus to take their place, who put their trust in him, what Paul is saying here to us is, is God saves. The gavel comes down as God looks at Jesus and God declares us righteous because of him. Amen. What a wonderful Savior. How wonderful that Jesus is our Savior and... He becomes the very basis of our justification. Jesus is our justification before God. Third, not only is Jesus our salvation, our justification, but third, Jesus is our redemption. Jesus is our redemption. He says here, We are justified, this is verse 24, we're justified by his grace as a gift. And then he says this, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This theme of redemption is all through the New Testament. In fact, um, you can just make a whole list of all the scriptures where you can find the theme of redemption. It's a really important theme that God gives us to understand what he's done for us. Um, what's so amazing is some people think that the only way of understanding salvation is a courtroom type understanding, like being legally counted right with God. That, that is part of understanding salvation. But even in this passage, there's three analogies that Paul gives us. This is the second one. He says, not only is it like you being in the courtroom, but I want you to imagine that it's like you being in bondage to slavery. And this image is, is not just here in Romans 3, it's all throughout the New Testament. It's a powerful image that God gives us, and some of the scriptures are here on the screen that you can write down. For instance, Mark 10, 45, Jesus says himself, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, 
and to give his life as a ransom. Do y'all see this word right here? Ransom. This is a picture of redemption. It goes back to Leviticus 15, 15, a ransom being set, and a price that needs to be paid for one to be redeemed. Jesus says, I want you to know that I, I love you and I came for you. And I came not that you would do something for me. I came not to be served. That's not the way you're going to be put right with me. I came to serve you. And I came to be the price that needed to be paid so that you could be set free. That's what Jesus says. Luke 21, 28. Jesus describes how when these things begin to take place, straighten your heads because your redeem, redemption is drawing near. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Paul says, And because of him, you who are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and what? And redemption. Do you see all these words? See, for you to have a relationship with Jesus, you have to know Jesus in all of these ways. I mean, it starts with a simple faith. That's all you need. But what I'm saying is you need to grow in understanding Jesus in all of these ways. He is our redemption. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have, what? Redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Paul says, Romans 3, verse 24, go back to your Bible. We are justified by his grace as a gift through the what? Redemption. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's such a beautiful picture of God's grace. Because it's a picture of all of us being held bondage. I read stories around the world. Um, I... I we have a good friend uh, who is in India, Chrisidas. He'll actually be visiting here in Memphis this week with our pastoral team, some of our missional leaders. He's going to be here for a few days. I can't get, wait to be with him. But he's helped us to know personal stories of people that he has known in India that literally are trafficked. Children, women that end up getting sold by their families of birth because of their families need desperate um, money. And these children or these women will get sold off and will get held in bondage. And we know that this happens all around the world and it even happens here in Memphis where people are getting held in bondage. And it feels like there's no way out. <laughs> like they're literally enslaved and often the stories that come out of their time of enslavement are horrible. They're horrific. But Chrysidus has these, he's these, these, told us these beautiful stories of how he, as a follower of Christ, has felt so burdened by these who are being trafficked in his own country and these stories that he's heard of or these, these people that he's met that he's actually figured out a way to actually gather money together to go and buy back these people from the ones who are enslaving them for the opportunity to just set them free <laughs> and hopeful opportunity that they may know the forgiveness and the freedom of Jesus Christ. Every time I hear stories like that, I just marvel because it, it, it paints a picture to me of my spiritual condition. I was in bondage. By my own choice, I had given myself up to sin and, and to the one who oversees the realm of darkness and horrors of life in that place. But God in his grace saw me in that condition. And in his love, he came after me. 
And he came to pay a price, a ransom price, a price that was the only price that could be, have been paid to, to ransom me, to rescue me out of enslavement and to set me free into a life with God. And that price was his own blood. There's this beautiful picture that Paul's trying to help you see. Do you know that there's a way to be put right with God through a kinsman redeemer? (laughs) Through one who has come to rescue you out of bondage. And do you see the price that he paid wasn't just a few coins, wasn't a few thousand or a few million dollars to rescue you out of bondage. He had to give his own life into bondage and ultimately unto death for your sin. What a great Savior is Jesus Christ. He is our salvation. He is our justification. He is our redemption. There's no one who can set you free other than Jesus Christ. He is a forgiver and he is one who can bring true freedom. He's come for this. But not just this. Fourth, he is our propitiation. He is our propitiation. That's a big word. We don't use that word much in Memphis. Y'all ever go down to Starbucks and just kind of chat it up about propitiation? Probably not. Um, I want to try to help explain the word and its significance. Chapter 3, verse 25 says, Who God put forward, he's speaking about Jesus here, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This Greek word here, is hilasterion. Hilasterion. And the reason that it's so important is because again and again in the Bible, this word is used to refer to the atonement cover. Or another way you could think of this is the mercy seat. Y'all ever heard of this in the scripture? So, probably most prominently used in the Old Testament, we have places like Exodus chapter 15 where God instructs, you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I give you and there I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubim that are on the ark and the testimony, I'll speak with you about all that I'll give you in the commandment for the people of Israel. So the idea of the atonement cover, Leviticus chapter 16, like the day of atonement where the ritual is described, is you have this picture of the holiness of God, the smoke filling the tabernacle, the curtain separating us from even God's presence. He is so holy and we are so sinful that a separation is there. That's our condition apart from God's salvation. And yet they would gather all the people around and they would bring themselves together and they would watch as spotless young animals in front of them would be brought forward and they would lay their hands on these animals and they would confess all of their sin onto the animal, so to speak. And then the animal would be killed, its blood poured out in front of them. The, this spotless, innocent, young animal horrifically killed right in front of them. Why? Because their sin has been transferred onto this animal. The blood poured out and put into a bowl and one high priest dressed up in royal looking regalia would walk in with the blood that was poured out. He'd have a rope tied to his feet in case something horrible happened in the presence 
of the holy God because of his sin and the people's sin, they could pull him out without having to go behind the curtain themselves. But God gave permission one day a year to walk in with that blood and what he would do in the presence of a holy God over the Ark of the Covenant, which we know now had that mercy seat on it, symbolizing the very presence of God. He would pour out that blood over the mercy seat. And by doing so, the Old Testament described that as that happened, God was making atonement for their sins. In other words, there was a covering that became sufficient to satisfy for their sins. It was a place of God's mercy. What Paul is saying here is God put for Jesus not just to be your salvation, not just to be your justification in the courtroom, not just to be your redemption out of bondage into freedom and forgiveness, but also to be your propitiation. God put for Jesus. John looked at him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In other words, all of that in the Old Testament was a foreshadowing of the moment that Jesus, the true and perfect Lamb of God, would step onto the scene and Jesus himself would be the one. All of us confessing our sins unto him, he would be the one bearing our sin and our shame and it would be him on the cross, the perfect, innocent Lamb of God who would pour out all of his blood and by his blood, he would walk in not to an earthly tabernacle or temple made with hands, but he would walk into the true and heavenly tabernacle, the very presence of the holiness of God, and he would offer his own blood upon the mercy seat. Do you see it? And as he did that, the true high priest offering his own blood, God makes atonement for all of us who believe. Aren't you grateful for Jesus? Aren't you grateful for a perfect, spotless Lamb of God who also is our high priest? And by his blood, he actually makes a true and living and eternal atonement. So as you trust in him, as you confess your sins upon him, as you depend upon him, as you look to him and treasure him, he forever will be your mercy seat before the Father your propitiation by his blood for you to receive all that he is and all that he gives by what? By faith. Fifth, God's righteousness. Not only is Jesus our salvation, our justification, our redemption, our propitiation, but fifth, he is our righteousness. Verse 25 and 26 says, this, all that Paul's been describing, this was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It is so, so critical that you'll understand this verse. Because the big question is, how can God actually remain righteous? In other words, maintain a perfect record of being just, always doing what is right, and at the same time make sinners who deserve justice righteous. How can there be a righteousness of God and at the same time a righteousness from God for sinners? How can a just God 
justify justifying you. <laughs> Do you get it? How can that happen? Because if God forgave us by becoming indifferent to sin, if the only way he could justify his people was to give up his role as a judge, right? So in other words, imagine God becomes indifferent to sin. He's no longer going to act as a judge. Well, that would be unloving to victims of sin. It would give us absolutely no confidence for the future, and it would compromise God's character. God should, he must judge us. Y'all agree? He can't not judge. And actually, we don't want him to not judge. The wonder of the gospel is that God has judged, but he's judged us in his own son. John Murray writes this, God loved the objects of his wrath so much that he gave his only son, his own son to the end that he, by his blood, should make provision for the removal of his wrath. So in other words, God does not turn his justice aside. He doesn't set it aside. Instead, what he does is he turns it onto himself. The cross is not a compromise between God's wrath and God's love. It doesn't like meet halfway. It's not like they worked it out, right? And they like go 50-50. No. Rather, it satisfies the fullness of God's wrath and the fullness of God's love. On the cross, God's love and God's wrath fully satisfied. Both of them demonstrated and expressed perfectly. C.S. Lewis, y'all ever read C.S. Lewis? Um, I'll use this illustration and then I'll go to our final point. Um, the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, he explores the same idea kind of imaginatively. Selfishness and greed uh, of Peter, y'all know the story. Um, he's fallen into the hands of the wicked witch. I thought about this uh, recently. Somebody gave me some Turkish delight, and I was like, I don't know if I want to eat that. Um, Aslan, who's the lion in the story, he the, represents the character of God, cannot, for all of his immense power, rescue the boy, for he must acknowledge the magic, the law of nature that has given the witch power over the boy. But then he speaks of a deeper magic from the dawn of time that enables one who dies willingly for someone else to take on that person's punishment and to let them go free. And so Aslan allows the wicked witch to execute him fully satisfies the law while at the same time fully forgives and frees the one who deserved the punishment of that law. God, Paul says, if you look at the cross, what you're looking at is God showing that he is just. Our sin is so wretched that he had to die Wrath had to be poured out. Sin cannot and will not go unpunished. So on the cross, as you look at Jesus Christ, you are seeing the wrath of God, the justice of God for your sin. And not just for your sin, but for the sins of all who have trusted in Christ. And he even speaks to this. This has happened even before. God had forgiven looking to the day that Christ would die and the, his wrath would be poured out. Even before this point, you are seeing a just God. Your sin is so wretched he had to die, but you're also seeing a loving God. For he loves you so much that he was glad to die. So on the cross, at the same moment, God is both just 
and what? The justifier as you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Aren't you so grateful for the love of God for you that he would take your place, take all of the wrath that you deserve and give you all of the grace that you do not deserve and at the same moment uphold his perfect character. Praise be to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Last but not least, we get to the conclusion of all this. <laughs> and Paul says as he closes in verses 27 to 31, not only should Jesus be our salvation, our justification, our redemption, our propitiation, our understanding of the righteousness of God, but last as we close, he says, thus, if you understand Jesus in all these ways, then you have to understand that Jesus should be your only boast. The gospel should humble us, verse 27 and 28. Then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, by a law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. If you want to know someone who knows Jesus, look for those who are humble. Look for those who don't want to bring attention to themselves. Look for those who don't boast in themselves, what they do, what they attain, what they achieve. Ones who are quietly secure in Christ, but humbly aware that truly it all comes from Christ. See, when we come into relationship with Jesus and we know that it's all his grace, it's all a gift that we received, he has saved us. He stepped in when we had no ability to do it ourselves. He has become our justification in the courtroom. He has become our kinsman redeemer as we were enslaved. Uh, he truly is our mercy seat. He covers us with his blood. All of my sin that I deserve the wrath of God for was poured out on him. The, 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 the wrath of God was poured out in my Savior. He paid the penalty for my sins and he forgives me. And he washes me clean and he sets me free. For me, knowing Jesus, it makes me the most humble person. Because I, I sing the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. For us, the gospel should humble us because we know that it's not anything of us. It's not the works of the law. It's just our trust in Christ and even our faith we can't boast in. It's, it's just him. Our only boast becomes him. Jesus is everything. I say all the time here at this church, as Christians, the, the testimony of our lives should be not that we are great people, but that we have a great Savior. We should always be saying, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. Secondly, the gospel should unite us. Verses 29 to 30 says, or is God the God of Jews only, or is he the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? In other words, Paul is saying, we got to be done with divisions. If we are in Christ, that's what matters. So if the gospel does anything, it should humble us and it should unite us with other people who share faith in Christ because we're not saved because we're rich or we're poor or we're white or we're black or we're American or we're Iranian like they're going to play in the game today, right? We're not saved because we live in the continent of North America or one lives in the continent of Africa or because you had a good Christian family or you were baptized or anything else like that or you were Methodist or Baptist or Catholic or whatever. We are only saved because of Jesus Christ. So all the rest of that stuff, cut it out and unite with others around the one who is everything to us, Jesus Christ. We gotta be a Jesus people, 
And we don't need to let other things stand in the way of our union with other people who also love and treasure and savor the salvation of Jesus. And last but not least, the gospel should all us. It should all us. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith, Paul says? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. In other words, what he says here is, uh, so are you saying then like the law doesn't matter? He's imagining someone asking that question. Like this is all by faith. And he's going, no, no. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Because the law is what shows us the holiness of God. It helps us to know his beauty and his worth, how much he deserves, how righteous and good and perfect and beautiful he is. And the law also helps us to know how far we have fallen short and how much we need his salvation. The law, in its original design, and even to this day, points our way to know the grace of Jesus. It helps us to know how God has stepped in as our savior and our justifier and our redeemer and our propitiation, our righteousness. And it leads us to all. Friends, if anything that the gospel should do, it should lead us onto our knees and worship. Jesus is our salvation, our justification, our redemption, our propitiation, God's righteousness, and our only boast. And I close by asking you today, have you put your faith in Jesus? I can tell you who Jesus is, but I cannot make you trust him. But I'm telling you today, If you don't trust him, there is no hope. There is only one way to be right with God now and forever, and it's through putting all of your hope and trust and confidence in Jesus. And today, you can make that choice. So I just want to pray that God would lead you, whether for the first time or for a repeated time, to savor the salvation of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your word to us. And we just pray, God, that you would allow your word to bear fruit in our lives. Father, I pray today, God, that if there's anyone here who has not trusted you, that today, God, would be a day that they recognize their need and recognize the sufficiency of your salvation and your amazing grace. God, all of us are helpless apart from you. But you have come to save us. And we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your righteousness. God, I pray today, God, for the variety of needs that are in this room. I know, God, that there are many who are asking big questions, who are in need of help, in need of hope. I just pray today, God, that we could just look to you, Jesus. You are a living Savior. You came for us. You live for us. You died for us. And you rose for us. And today you live. And you are all of these things and more. And those who hope in you will not be put to shame. So we look to you, Jesus. You are everything. As we worship, God, I just pray that you would minister to us by your spirit. You would encourage us and help us and even save We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for watching this Bible teaching from Island Community Church. We want to encourage you to join us in person for worship soon. For more information about our worship gatherings, gospel resources, and ways to connect with ICC, you can visit us at iccmemphis.com or download our Island Community Church app. As we close, we offer a prayer blessing for you from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope.